committee will come to order. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing, Cybersecurity, Assessing the Immediate Threat to the United States. Appreciate your patience and understanding as we had votes earlier. And I know we are getting off to a delayed start, but I appreciate you all being here and, and, and participating. I will also welcome uh, Ranking Member Tierney, members, members of the subcommittee, and appreciate everybody being here today. Today's hearing is designed to act as a prelude to the full committee hearing, which we conducted a week later on June 1st, uh, later uh, in just a short of, uh, time from now. It is entitled Cybersecurity, Assess Assessing the Nation's Ability to Address the Gro Growing Cyber Threat. During today's hearing, the subcommittee is scheduled to receive testimony from the administration, industry, and civilian cyber threat experts, all of whom will likely state that cyber-related intrusions pose one of the greatest threats to our national security. The intent is to obtain detailed information from various sources and from various perspectives as to what the current threat actually entails so the committee can later delve more deeply into how effective the nation has been in confronting the immediate cyber threat, as well as building defenses which safeguard us from what appears to be a daunting future cybersecurity environment. Given the unusual nature of the cyber threat, it cannot be addressed solely by using the traditional national security apparatus. In short, the Federal Government is currently incapable of securing the nation against cyber threats on its own and must embrace a broad, transparent involvement of non-government entities. Like other countries, approximately 85 percent of the nation's critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector, many of which are small businesses. Because the nation relies so heavily on private industry to protect this infrastructure, trusted partnerships between the government and private sector must also be a priority. In words of the President, quote, cybersecurity is a challenge that we as a government or as a country are not adequately prepared to counter, end quote. In addition, in a recent interview, Howard Schmidt, the U.S. Cybersecurity Coordinator, emphasized the critical nature of public-private partnerships as it relates to cybersecurity. Unfortunately, Mr. Schmidt refused to testify today. I truly do find this unfortunate, as I believe he should be here in this important discussion. I am deeply concerned that Mr. Schmidt is the Executive Branch's Cybersecurity Coordinator, charged with the responsibility for, quote, orchestrating the many important cybersecurity activities across the government, end quote, believes that his management of this critical issue is exempt from congressional oversight. That is certainly inconsistent with what I have heard the administration and this President say about the openness and transparency of the administration. In his, in his absence, the administration has sent to us an expert from the Department of Homeland Security. There was quite a debate whether the administration would allow him to sit on the same panel as the industry experts sitting in front of us today. I am glad that the issue was resolved in a matter of a few hours ago and that we will now be able to receive testimony from both the public and private perspective together on one panel. In the future, I hope this is not so difficult. That said, I must stress my sincere disappointment in the number of days wasted debating the need to hear testimony from government and private witnesses alike at the same time on the same <laughs> panel and in a manner that allows members to most effectively oversee this critical private this public private partnership. I believe it is critical that while we focus on the cyber threat, we also keep in mind the need to develop well coordinated strategic cybersecurity partnerships with the private sector in order to confront, confront the threat. The administration has made repeated public statements about the importance of this partnership. Even the White House directed cyberspace policy review conducted that the United, concluded that the United States cannot succeed in securing cyberspace if it works in isolation and should enhance its partnerships with the private sector. Cybersecurity experts agree that given the likely national security impact of cyber attacks on the economy, our critical infrastructures such as transportation, energy and communications, both private and public sectors must work together closely and in a very transparent way. This would also appear to be in line with the President's stated commitment to, quote, to, quote, to create an unprecedented level, level of openness in government, end quote, and, quote, to establish a system of transparency, public participation and collaboration, end quote. The ever-changing face of the cyber threat means that the authorities and capabilities needed to confront the threat will likely need to be changed or updated on a regular basis. This is the reason why Congress must be as attentive to the threat as any other part of the government. I do not believe anybody knowledgeable of cybersecurity would deny that cyber threat is a major national security issue for the United States. The National Security Strategy, published in May of 2010, highlights that cybersecurity threats represent one of the most serious national security, public safety and economic challenges we face as a nation. Therefore, a national dialogue on the securing the Nation's digital infrastructure must happen now and continue indefinitely. It is my sincere hope that this dialogue can, can include many segments of society and can be done in a nonpartisan way. 
It is my hope that we as a nation bring to bear against this threat all expertise that resides within the country. Strangely, we are faced with a critical national security threat to which the expertise needed to confront it does not necessarily reside solely in the Federal Government, but also in the private sector. A recent research project conducted by Mac McAfee and the Center for Strategic and International Studies looked at the threats to power grids, oil, gas, and water across 14 countries. It concluded that there had been dramatic increases in cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, with as much as 80 percent of the companies experiencing, quote, large-scale attacks, end quote. According to the project report, nearly 30 percent of the companies believed they were unprepared for the attack, and then when more than 40 percent expected a major cyber attack within the next 12 months. Also, according to an Office of Management and Budget report, the number of reported cyber instances, incidents affecting U.S. Federal agencies shot up 39 percent in 2010, 39 percent. Approximately 41,776 reported attacks, up from roughly 30,000 the year before. I am positive the witnesses will elaborate on the threat, and I look forward to hearing from the panel. We will now recognize the distinguished uh, ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you. Director of the Control Systems Security Program at the Department of Homeland Security's National Cybersecurity Division. It's a short title. Uh, Mr. McGurk has uh, agreed to testify before the subcommittee. Well, it was pretty much a short notice for him uh, and during a week which the Department of Homeland Security, as I understand, is going to be testifying in five different uh, cybersecurity hearings, including a similar hearing that was held this morning. Uh, and I know next week the full committee is going to hold yet another hearing on cybersecurity featuring four different senior level administration witnesses to discuss the Administration's comprehensive legislative proposal to improve cybersecurity with a focus on our Nation's critical infrastructure and the Federal Government's own networks and computers. Uh, the proposal was drafted in response to the numerous legislative proposals introduced in the last Congress and specific requests from Congressional leadership. Uh, that White House legislation won't be the focus of today's hearing, uh, but is still a much-needed starting point for a very important conversation. Uh, and as somebody who doesn't purport to be a techie at all, uh, I can tell you I have a great deal of concern about the exposure that we have uh, in this area, particularly after having served a number of years on the uh, Intelligence Committee, uh, and where that conversation goes uh, should cause some sleepless nights for a lot of people. Uh, as the computer technology has advanced, Federal agencies and our Nation's critical infrastructure, whether it is power distribution or water supply, telecommunications or emergency services, have all become increasingly dependent on computerized information systems to carry out their operations, to process and maintain and report. Uh, all of that uh, has been a, a service where public and private organizations increasingly rely on computer systems to transfer money and sensitive and proprietary information, conduct operations and deliver services. The interconnected nature of these systems creates risk for our national security, our economic security and our public safety. Now, just last month uh, in Massachusetts, a virus called W32.quackbot, Q-A-K-B-O-T, of all things, was discovered on computers at the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development. As a result, the Labor Department said as many as 210,000 unemployed workers may have had data compromised, including their names, Social Security numbers, employer identification numbers, addresses and email addresses. Although the virus was originally discovered back in April, it wasn't until last week that the Labor Department realized the virus had survived its early eradication efforts and resulted in a data breach. That specific example happened at a State government agency, but it highlights the potential threat to Americans all across the country if our Federal computer networks are not adequately protected. Uh, as many commentators have documented, cyber attacks on our Federal IT systems are on the rise. The Chairman just went through the numbers on that. It is becoming increasingly clear that current efforts to counter, uh, counteract the attacks are woefully insufficient. The connectivity between information systems, the Internet and other infrastructures also creates opportunities for attackers to disrupt telecommunications, electrical power and other critical services. Some industry sectors are so vital to the Nation that their incapacity or destruction would have a debilitating impact on national security, the national economic security or public health and safety. Federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies have identified multiple sources of threats to our information systems and our critical infrastructure. These threats include foreign nations engaged in espionage and information warfare, criminals, hackers, disgruntled employees and contractors. 
In one recent example, it has been alleged that the Chinese government spread a virus that attacked Google and at least 80 other United States companies. Not all threats to Federal cybersecurity are external. In June 2010, WikiLeaks released thousands of classified Department of State and Department of Defense documents. Immediately following the release of those documents, the Secretary of Defense commissioned two internal Department of Defense studies to evaluate any weaknesses in their system. The studies found that the Department's policies for dealing with an internal security threat were inadequate and that the Department had limited capability to detect and monitor anomalous behavior on its classified computer networks. So these examples simply underline the need for a comprehensive legislative approach that will protect our national security, health, safety, and all the American people. We have an obligation to ensure that the government's IT systems are secure and that any critical infrastructure is protected from the threat of cyber attack. The failure to properly secure these networks could have dire consequences. So I look forward to this hearing and to learning more about the threat landscape and the challenges we face in addressing this growing problem. And again, I thank our witnesses and Chairman, Mr. Chairman for bringing this hearing. Thank you. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now recognize uh, the panel. Uh, Mr. Sean McGurk is Director of National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center at the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Philip Bond is the President of Tech America. Mr. James A. Lewis is Director of the Technology and Public Policy Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And Mr. Dean Turner is the Director of Global Intelligence Network Security Response at Symantec. Again, gentlemen, we appreciate you all being here. We would like to recognize each of you for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, if you could try to keep it to five minutes and any additional uh, information that you want to provide, um, please, uh, we will be able to submit it to the record. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will now recognize uh, Mr. McGurk for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Sean McGurk. I am the Director for the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, henceforth known as NCIC. Thank you for inviting me today to discuss this important issue along with this distinguished panel of experts on cyber threats and the impact on critical infrastructure. As both the Chairman and the Ranking Member have already identified, sensitive information is routinely stolen from both government and private sector networks. Last year, we saw an increase in the threat as a result of not what was being taken from networks, but what was being by left behind in the result of what was known as Stuxnet. Successful cyber attacks could potentially result in physical damage and loss of life. There are many challenges in the current landscape, strong and rapidly expanding capabilities, lack of comprehensive threat and vulnerability awareness, and our information infrastructure is dependent upon its continual availability for our way of life. The cyber environment is not homogeneous under a single department or agency or the private sector. We recognize that cybersecurity is a team sport. Government does not have all the answers, so we must work closely with the private sector to provide solutions. There is no one-size-fits-all and there is no Maginot line to protect the cyber domain. It is about information sharing and it is about sharing knowledge collectively. Knowledge is only power when it is shared. We must leverage our expertise and our access to information along with industry-specific needs, capabilities, and timelines. Each partner has a significant role to play and a unique, unique capability in this uh, diversity uh, in this environment. In my 35, 34 years of experience with over 28 years serving in the United States Navy, you learn that everyone has an ability to contribute. The mission in cyber is, uh, is manifold, and our goals are clear. In the law enforcement environment, they work closely with the other agencies to identify and prosecute cyber intrusions. The intelligence and, and uh, military community works to attribute, to defend, and then to pursue those individuals. DHS, along with the private sector, including the financial services sector, energy sector, communications, and others, work to prepare, prevent, respond, recover, and restore. Coordinating the national response to, uh, to domestic emergencies is more of a matter of what and how, and not necessarily who and why, until much later. To that end, I would like to emphasize that my responsibilities from an operational standpoint are focused on preventing and resolving attacks, not attributing the source of those threats. I would be willing to take any questions in the future regarding the cyber threats and the cyber capabilities of other countries, 
with the committee under an uh, appropriate classified setting with the uh, uh, available in interagency representatives. The NCIC, or the National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center, works closely with government and all levels of the private sector to coordinate the integrated and unified response to cyber communications incidents. Sponsoring security clearances for the private sector enables us to have our uh, industry partners on the watch floor in a classified environment looking at actionable intelligence and providing information to asset owners and operators in near real time. The DHS components have all been integrated into the NCIC, along with representatives from other agencies such as the National Security Agency, U.S. Cyber Command, FBI, and the U.S. Secret Service, and representatives from the intelligence community at large. In, a different, in, a, in addition, we have private sector representatives sitting on, the, sitting on the watch floor from the communications sector, the IT sector, the financial services sector, and the energy sector. Additionally, we have representatives from state, local, tribal, and territorial governments represented by the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. In conclusion, with, within our current legal authorities, we continue to engage, collaborate, and provide analysis, vulnerability, and mitigation assistance to the private sector. We have experience and expertise in dealing with the private sector in planning, steady state, and crisis scenarios. We have deployed numerous incident response teams and assessment teams that enable us to prevent, respond, recover, and restore from cyber incidents. Finally, we work closely with the private sector and our interagency partners in law enforcement and in the intelligence community to provide the full complement and capabilities of the Federal Government for the private sector in response to a cyber incident. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the panel, uh, let me conclude by re reiterating that I look forward to exploring opportunities to advance this mission in collaboration with the subcommittee and my colleagues in the public and private sector. Also, if the committee has any questions regarding the administration's legislative proposal, I will be happy to defer those issues to the policy representatives testifying before the full committee next week. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bond, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, and members of the committee. Honored to be here on behalf of Tech America, the largest industry trade association in the space in the U.S. with some 1,000 member companies. Offer just a few thoughts on the challenge in cyber and the policy response we need. First, I would observe that cyber criminals respond rapidly. They are creative. In 2010, McAfee Labs identified more than 20 million new pieces of malware globally. Uh, 2011 online fraud report from RSA, the division, security division of EMC, found that the U.S. has consistently hosted and been the target of a majority of the worldwide cyber attacks. Economic impact is serious. It is about $6 million a day when a corporation's site is down on average. And worldwide, the economy uh, loses some $86 billion a year due to cyber attacks. Protecting our networks is, as the Chair has observed, a public-private shared responsibility. Neither one of us can do it alone. The private sector responsibility to innovate and operate its own infrastructure in a safe way. The government uh, an obligation to share timely and accurate information so that the private sector can secure itself and turn around and help to secure the government. I will defer to our witness from Symantec on uh, a little bit more technical descriptions of some of the threats, I would just underscore this. A range of threat actors, especially right now including advanced persistent threats, APTs, you will hear more about that, are going directly after the end user. They attempt to trick them into downloading malware or divulging sensitive information. Again, it is the actual user being targeted, not the mechanical system, the software or whatever. So it is going after human error. as as criminals probe for a soft spot in a system, they are also probing now the individuals who connect to that network. Now, with the increased uh, reliance on all kinds of IT devices, now we see the great shift to mobile devices, and that, too, will be an opportunity for cyber criminals. Applications many times are downloaded by users not, uh, and not always being properly vetted. So we would submit that the policymakers in the space and the industry as well, and the government, need to view security as an absolute basic, a basic, not to be added on after, but to be built in from the ground up. And now I would like, and I would observe, many companies are doing exactly that. We need everybody to do that. 
I want to uh, spend a little, couple of minutes here remaining on some thoughts for you to consider as you craft legislation, but let me break here to underscore something that needs to be said. Technology and innovation are a huge net positive for the U.S. economy and for government, for government service as well. They are our key to national security. The warfighter has an advantage. The key to homeland security, the key to economic security, high-paying jobs, where we need to be as an economy. But with those advantages, there also have been some downsides. That is what we are uh, attempting to talk about today. So please consider, first, in policy, Congress should do no harm. Do not undermine innovation. It is our advantage. One size fits all will not work. Second, government should procum promote an outcome-based, layered security approach. Government should develop processes to manage and measure performance associated with real security. Third, government should adopt a risk-based approach to our nation's infrastructure. That means critical infrastructure should be defined to include only that which is of the utmost importance to national security and then truly work to secure it. Fourth, we believe government can provide incentives to encourage industry to invest and do the right uh, and, and best practices in security. For example, safe harbor from data breach notification when an organization does what it should in advance of a breach incident. Fifth, Congress should uh, update our government's federal information security practices and uh, laws to perform in a more nimble environment. So we strongly support updating FISMA. And I know the committee knows about that. Finally, if industry is to act at the behest of government, it is necessary that there be clear liability protections. So if you do what you should do or at the government's behest, you should also be protected from unintended consequences or liabilities. Again, on behalf of the industry, thank you for holding the hearing. We look forward to uh, doing all that we can to be a part of the public-private partnership to find a solution and maintain our national advantage in innovation. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify. Um, I am really uh, impressed with the energy that the committee is bringing to this issue. It is something we need. Um, we depend as a nation on the Internet, but it is not secure, and this gives criminals and foreign opponents a real opportunity to damage the United States. Cyber threats fall into two categories high-end attacks that cause damage, destruction or casualties, and threats from cybercrime and cyber espionage. Five countries, including Russia and China, can launch high-end cyber attacks. Another 30 countries are developing these capabilities. States use skilled proxies, cyber criminals and hackers, to help them. Um, cyber attacks could destroy critical infrastructure or disrupt essential networks and services. At the moment, However, um, no nation is likely to attack, attack the United States because they fear uh, retaliation. Terrorists do not yet have cyber attack capabilities, nor do dangerous nations like Iran and North Korea. However, they are eagerly pursuing these cyber capabilities. We do not know how close they are to acquiring them, um, but the moment they acquire them, we can expect to see a damaging cyber attack. The immediate threat to the national interest comes from crime and espionage. The Internet, with all its weaknesses, has created a golden age for espionage, and the U.S. has been the chief victim. We have lost military technology, intellectual property from high-tech companies, oil exploration data, and confidential business information. Banks suffer million-dollar losses almost every month. Um, none of this attracts much attention. Some companies prefer to conceal their losses. And in some cases, companies may not even know they have been hit. Uh, estimates of the damages, as you heard, are in the billions of dollars. Weak cybersecurity damages our economic competitiveness and technological leadership. Um, what can we do about this? And there is certainly a new energy in Washington about approaching this problem, which is great. Uh, first, we need to accept that we need a new approach that puts cybersecurity as a major national security problem. The most dangerous threats in cyberspace come from foreign militaries and foreign intelligence agencies. Second, this new approach needs to combine trade policy, law enforcement, military strategy, and critical infrastructure protection. For critical infrastructure, this means that DHS must be able to mandate risk-based performance standards. 
Public-private partnerships are an important part of this. It would help, however, to differentiate where the private sector is strongest in things like information sharing or innovation and where government action is needed. The immediate question uh, is whether we can improve our defenses before there is a damaging attack. Most of the experts I know believe this is not possible, that America will only act after a crisis. I believe that the work of this committee and others can help us avoid that fate and let us do what is necessary to improve public safety and national security in cyberspace. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Turner, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Chaffetz and Ranking Member Tierney and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today as the committee considers cybersecurity and the current threat level to the United States. And, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the nearly 500 somatic employees based in your district in Linden, we certainly appreciate your focus on cybersecurity issues. Uh, my name is Dean Turner, and I am the Director of Semantic's Global Intelligence Network. Uh, Semantic is the world's uh, information security leader. With over 25 years' experience in developing Internet security technology, our best in-class global intelligence network allows us to capture worldwide security intelligence data. We maintain 11 security response centers globally and utilize over 240,000 attack sensors in more than 200 countries to track malicious activity 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. In short, if there is a class of threat on the Internet, Symantec knows about it. In my written testimony, I have provided the Committee with greater detail on the evolving threat landscape, as well as an assessment of some of the real-world impacts of cyber attacks on businesses and individuals. I also touch on major challenges and vulnerabilities associated with securing new technologies and how organizations can better secure their important and critical systems. In our April 2011 Semantic Internet Security Threat Report, we observed several key threat landscape trends for the calendar year of 20, 000, uh, 2010. The year was bookended by two significant targeted attacks, including Hydrac, otherwise known as Aurora, and Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a game changer, exemplifying just how sophisticated and targeted threats are becoming. It demonstrated the vulnerability of critical national infrastructure to attack, and Stuxnet was the first publicly known threat to target industrial control systems. Social networks. Social networks continue to be a security concern for organizations as government agencies and companies struggle to find a satisfactory compromise between leveraging the advantages of social networking and limiting the dangers posed by the increased exposure of potentially sensitive and exploitable information. Leveraging information from social networking sites as part of a social engineering campaign is one of the simplest and most effective ways an attacker can lure their target to a malicious website. For example, an attacker can use information gathered from a social networking site to create a targeted email that then lures a victim to a website that hosts malicious code. If the victim visits the website, a Trojan, for example, a keystroke logger or backdoor, can be installed and that, that begins exfiltrating sensitive information back to the attacker. In 2010, attack toolkits continued to see widespread use. A typical toolkit today is built to allow the cybercriminal to monetize infected machines in every way possible. For example, keystroke loggers are a simple way to capture any password a user type in. Other Trojans can also steal email addresses found on the machine, as well as add additional malware. Attack toolkits and their ability to update over the web greatly increase the speed with which new vulnerabilities are packaged, exploited, and spread. One of the most significant attack kits known at the moment is the Zeus Trojan and is a favorite of cyber criminals due to its ease of use and low cost, about $400 in the underground economy. It takes little to no technical knowledge to launch this type of attack, and of course it can be extremely profitable for cyber criminals. With the proliferation of smartphones and mobile devices, users are increasingly downloading third-party applications, which has created an opportunity for the installation of malicious applications. In 2010, there was a 42 percent increase in the number of reported new mobile operating system vulnerabilities, and most mobile code, malicious code is now designed to generate revenue. Therefore, there is likely going to be more threats created for these devices as people increasingly use them for sensitive transactions, such as online shopping and banking. 
We have learned many lessons from today's threat landscape. And while the sophistication level of attacks is increasing, as is the potential and real damage caused by such attacks, we need to turn these lessons into action. In addition to the recommendations contained in my written testimony, the following steps must be taken in order to better protect critical systems from cyber attack. First, develop and enforce IT policies and automate compliance processes. Second, authenticate identities by leveraging solutions that allow businesses to ensure only authorized personnel have access to those systems. And third, secure endpoints, messaging, and web environments. In addition, defending critical internal servers and implementing the ability to back up and recover data need to be top priorities. Members of the committee, cybersecurity faces a constantly evolving threat, and there is no single solution to prevent attacks. Attackers are getting smarter and more resourceful every day. Because of that, any solution must include the private sector's expertise and innovation. We must continue to be vigilant in protecting our economy, our national security, and our way of life. Semantic applauds Congress for focusing much needed attention on cybersecurity, and we look forward to continuing this important dialogue. I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, we will now start the questioning. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes and maybe even a little bit longer than that. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate all the expertise. I mean, continually, routinely, what we hear is the threat, the threat, the threat. It is happening. We are quantifying something at $86 billion and perhaps beyond. I do think there are probably a number of companies that would be embarrassed to, to, to even allow it out there that there was some sort of uh, security breach. Um, we are constantly told as consumers and shoppers that it is safe and secure to type in our, our critical information, our personal information, just because it has that little lock on there. Um, what should consumers now, what should the average person in Topeka, Kansas, what should they be thinking about when they go to type in? How, how do you really tell if it is secure or not? And can you ever? Um, anybody want to take a stab at that, Mr. Bond? Sure. I will take a uh, first stab at it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, that I would urge consumers to do what a national education campaign has urged, which is stop, think, and connect. So many of these uh, newly uh, designed threats that come in and pose as something they are not, trying to get you to either give information or simply click on a, a, a bogus connection, very often can be, uh, can be uh, understood or gleaned or, or perceived as a threat by simply stopping and thinking through, wait a minute, is this, is this really coming from uh, the company or entity that it purports to? Um, this, this links to issues about short uh, address names and other things that are, that are part of the challenge right now. But I do think that a public education campaign that tells people to stop and think and before they connect uh, can have measurable impacts. And so that is a beginning point. Uh, it, certainly the success of Twitter and Facebook in particular, social networks have, have, have become just immense uh, globally. Um, Mr. Lewis, what, what sort of threat or danger to young people, old people, people to participate on those types of social networks? How secure, if at all, is the information that is provided on those? Well, the intent, uh, Mr. Chairman, of course, for the information is to be public, so it is uh, easily collected. And we know there has been many problems in the past. One of them, my favorite in some ways, is the fact that people will often use you know, their pet's name or you know, their birthplace as their password, and then they will list it on the website. And so we have seen many, many incidences where guessing the password on these sites isn't that difficult. They are a treasure trove for uh, cyber criminals because you can harvest all kinds of data that will give you hints on passwords, employment, where your bank is. So they have become um, a kind of unmanageable uh, problem. Now, there is little that the companies can do about that. I don't want to blame Twitter or Facebook right. or any of them. People choose to put their information up there, and they haven't thought enough, as you heard from uh, Phil, they haven't thought enough about what the implications are. Uh, if you are going to have a Facebook account, don't use your dog's name as the password. <laughs> Um, uh, Mr. McGurk, I would like to learn a little bit more about the diff differences or perhaps the similarities between cyber attacks from domestic and international sources. Are there, are there distinguishes, distinguishable differences or motives between the domestic and the international actors as, as Homeland Security has seen it? 
Yes, sir. In the, in the Department, um, uh, as I had mentioned earlier during the testimony, is that we are focusing more on the risk mitigation strategy. So when we look in the National Infrastructure Protection Plan at the definition of risk, we identify it as threat, vulnerability and consequence. And the Department takes an all-hazards approach. Uh, the challenge there is identifying where the threat actors are originating. That is a part of it, but from our standpoint, from the mitigation standpoint, in protecting the networks, restoring services and recovering, the actual source is not as important as the vulnerability and the consequence of those vulnerabilities. So that is really where the Department focuses most of its attention, and how to provide actionable intelligence to the asset owners and operators to prevent further escalation of the consequences of the uh, so, data and breach. So how far and wide are you doing that? You are doing that, I would assume, with, with the national uh, interests, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Federal assets that we have. What about the private sector? How involved do you get with them? I mean, there is obviously the Microsofts and Googles and Yahoos of the world, but then there is also you know, your, your more medium level size. Uh, how, how interactive are you? Can you possibly be with it will be literally virtually every single entity you could possibly think of. Sir, one, of the, uh, one of the areas that we focus on in the NKIC is our uh, assistant assess mission, where we actually send incident response teams and assessment teams out into the field. We have gone from companies of only seven employees that were experiencing cyber intrusion to Fortune 10 companies working with them to not only identify what the risk is, but to mitigate that risk in their cyber environments. On average, a week does not go by where I do not have a team in the field working with the private sector to address those cyber vulnerabilities and then to mitigate those risks. What, but what percentage of the companies can you possibly get to? Again, sir, we focus on, to date, uh, we have been able to conduct 75 risk assessments over this past year. We have not had uh, the opportunity or the requirement to turn anyone away. It is completely voluntary. So part of the challenge is when, we're at, when a risk or a, a threat or intrusion is identified to the Department, we will respond in kind with a team of cybersecurity uh, experts to assist in restoring services. But again, that is a matter of uh, the request coming from industry. Yes, Mr. Mott. Yes, thank you. I just want to observe here that this is where the power of the network can be tremendously valuable. DHS does not have to go out physically and talk to every company. We do need timely, actionable sharing of information so that the network, led by great vendors like Symantec and others, can then proliferate and spread that word to, to address whatever the vulnerability is at the earliest possible stage, as soon as we know about the threat you will uncover through the committee's efforts and hearings that there are information sharing challenges between the government and the private sector, between the private sector and the private sector. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. And I will recognize uh, Mr. Tierney for five minutes or whatever he would like. Thank you. So I am trying to work out something in my mind here that Mr. Bond uh, got me thinking about as he was talking about um, who is responsible for what and liability protections and incentives and all of that. Now, I understand with respect to our national security concerns and our homeland protection being a part of that, that for government systems, it's on, it's on our court. You know, we have the responsibility, we have to take care of it and move on from that. But in terms of the private sector, when you are not doing business with the government, mm -hmm. why isn't that on you? Uh, why is it on you to make sure that your systems are protected? I, I see that Mr. McGurk has got teams running all over the place doing what I would have thought was your job. You know, you're making sure that you're safe, making sure that nobody can get into your system, uh, making sure that consumer information is protected. Um, and if you don't do a good job of that, I suspect people aren't going to buy your product and, and aren't going to utilize your services. So I don't know why we have to give you incentives, and I don't know why you wouldn't be held liable if you make a mess of it. Certainly. And it's a, it's a, um, we probably your, need your, that technology I'm called the microphone. I'm, 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 thank you. Uh, it's an important observation because we believe market forces are primary to shaping good behavior, and we see that time and again. However, let me try to give you an example. If um, a small community is uh, targeted, and say the bank in that community is targeted because they want to get personal information or financial information, because there may be a lot of DOD workers in that community, and the Federal Government says, gee, that, that uh, small community bank has somehow been breached, and we need you to go offline for a minute to help figure this out because it is a serious threat. Uh, Farmer? But, uh, let me back up. Yes. But the government didn't supply that system to that bank. No. Right. Somebody in the and technology so, field so did on that. So you bet. if it is breached, you know, it is yes. nice that you use the example yes. a lot of government workers in there. Let's back no, up a second no. assume there aren't any government workers in I'm, that area. That is not the point of liability. Okay. 
Okay? So for, if for their um, inability to provide a secure system, there are going to be questions about the community bank in the future. But while they are down because of a government request or demand and Farmer McDonald doesn't get his loan and loses the farm, is, well, are, are, is the bank uh, liable because so they went down at government request? Forget the bank. The bank didn't put the system in. Right? They bought it from somebody and they, and they paid for their service of installing it or whatever. And if it goes down, whether it goes down because somebody breached it and the government suggests they go down or whatever, it is still their fault and their I'm, problem. And, and why wouldn't all of the responsibility right. and obligation lie with them? I'm, not lying with the government I'm, protecting national security. We right. don't assess the government every time they come in and protect us. Uh, yes. But the people that go out and sell to a bank in a community that they are going to give them a system that is safe and secure, why doesn't the buck stop there? I am trying to make a distinction that I think is legitimate. When then the government says, based on what we know, you should do this or we require you to do this, and you do that, any liability that stems from that step should be protected because you are doing something in accord with policy or government request. Okay, and you so, wouldn't do it on your own is what you are saying? You wouldn't look in and see what happened and figure that you are going to put those uh, safeguards in of your own no, volition? No, you would, and I am failing to communicate because I am trying no, to— No, you are not. I, I just don't, I don't accept your premise. It is not that you are failing to communicate. It is just for whatever reason that you have to do something or whatever like that, that it seems like your customer would want you to do and expect you to do, I don't understand the shifting of, of responsibility and, and obligation. Uh, if, if it is an action taken at government requirement or policy, I don't think then it is the government's intent to make a company liable for, for obeying the law. So let us take your example, which I, I thought was on the, <clears throat> the most favorable position you could think for yourself. Uh, Let us take that, that you know, there is a lot of people who work in the government, the Department of Defense, something living in a particular neighborhood doing business with a credit union or a bank, and the system that somebody in, in the private industry put in on the premise that it was secure and, and operative and all of that goes down and there is a breach. Um, you are telling me that you, know, you take the government to tell you to shut it down or the government to tell you how to put it up safely, you wouldn't come across that on your own, and that if you didn't come across it on your own, the government had to go in and take action, and therefore you should be responsible for anything that results from you taking those steps. So we wanted two things to happen. You are going to go in and try to resolve it yourself, or somebody is going to have to suggest to protect the consumers and the, neighbor, and the community that it is going to be done. And then you say, well, if I do it the way they say to do it, <clears throat> because I wouldn't do it on my own, then I am going to be shielded from any responsibility or liability. Is that your position? No, <laughs> no. But I appreciate your framing it for me. Uh, no, I, what I am trying to underscore is that when, when there is a policy or something in place that has a requirement to it, that, that there not be liability attached to obeying the requirement. We could think of a lot of, of different examples. But if you are adhering to the rules and best practices, and then something about that policy causes harm as a response, that, that that's something that you are obeying policy on and you should not be liable so when you are obeying. How do we ever get best policies to keep on getting better if you never have any incentive to do it because you are covered no. once you do the, the, the threshold thing that is in place at a given time? Well, I, I would re could reverse it and say, then, why would you ever obey the government rule if, if you are also not protected in obeying that well, rule. Maybe we don't have a government rule. Maybe we just leave you out there to the market. So when you go down and that community goes down or whatever, then you are on your own. Would that be something you want? There is no consumer protections, no government regulations? And would that make you more happy? No, I am I'm, I'm taking your earlier point that market forces really do matter. But I am trying to make the point that if we pass rules and companies obey those rules, that that should not usher in some liability because you obeyed the rule. And I guess I'm not trying to be contentious no, with you. I'm no. trying to get to the bottom of something I think is an interesting question to ask mm -hmm. here. Ought there be no government regulations in this area? Well, Mr. Tierney, if I, if I may interject. If after he answers it, I want to give him an opportunity to answer it, then I'm happy if sure. the chairman goes along with it. Since it's the two of us, I suppose we go back and forth all day. Okay? Mr. Bond, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm not advocating that. I think there are already uh, some regulations in place, certainly around the government systems and then how they interact with private sector systems through contractors and others. So I am not yeah, but here other to than advocate. That, should there be any government regulations on your know, provision of, of systems to private entities at all, or should it just be totally unregulated? I think that that is exactly the I think it is a good question that we should look at what are the use of standards, what are the use of industry best practice, and other things that government and the private sector are coming up with together, uh, and that any regulatory steps should be taken very carefully with all the expertise of the different players in the room. But I am not, I'm not here to draw any kind of line in the sand. I am here to say that 
You need technical experts like Mr. Turner and others in the room to understand what the implications are in an interconnected world. And just to add to that, sir, um, I think it is important that when we are discussing liability that you know, we acknowledge the fact that it is incredibly difficult to, to pin where that liability sits. There is no such thing as a 100 percent secure, foolproof uh, piece of software. It doesn't exist out there, I am sorry to say. Well, there Vulnerabilities, was, sir, are a fact of but life. But there was never a 100 percent secure train either, but at some uh, point uh, liability went to the, auto, to the locomotive company because you know, technology had advanced to the point where they were the ones that should be held responsible for anything that, that came from that. I, so, I understand, sir, but when you are asking to assess liability on a particular focal point, whether that be the Federal Government, the private sector, or the vendor or whatever, we have to deal with something called the law of unintended consequences. It is virtually impossible for us uh, as an industry or anybody to be able to test with 100 percent certainty how that particular product, software, service is going to be used in that situation. But our liability has, uh, system has never gone on 100 percent certain, uh, and that it has been who is responsible and, and then people make a decision about what is reasonable. I, and I, so I think I, what I am just trying to figure out here is whether it is reasonable to leave it all to the industry to set the standards and do it out and then to suffer whatever consequences or obligation it might be, or is there some advocacy here that the government should, on behalf of the consumer, whether that might be a business or an individual, set some standards and, and for compliance on that. And I, and I suspect, haven't sir, figured out whether you people are for or against one way or the other yet. I, and I suspect, sir, you will find that the, you know, the, the answer lies somewhere in the middle, that it is, again, that public-private partnership. Can I add something, Mr. Chairman, on this? Because it is an interesting line of questioning, and there is a point that we might want to put out right in the open. And I think uh, if you would uh, use your experience and the experience of other committee members with the intelligence community, you would be able to confirm this. But there is no such thing as a secure, unclassified system. Um, I have been told by senior intelligence officials that they have never seen an unclassified system that has not been penetrated. So we are dealing with a problem where anyone can get in, right? And the solution to that is not a technological solution. Yes, over time, our technologies will get better and that will squeeze out the low-end threat. So the high school kid who used to be able to break in in a couple hours, now he might have to spend a little more time. But I think that is why a lot of us uh, are in favor of a comprehensive approach. You need to have law enforcement cooperation with other countries. You need to have strong military forces to deter potential opponents. You need to work with the service providers to get them to help consumers. And you do need some kind of what we are calling now risk-based standards uh, run through the government that would impose some requirements on at least critical infrastructure companies. If we can get a package together, we can deal with the problem, but no single part will solve this uh, very damaging situation. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I am taking from that is you don't feel that you can do your optimum job without the assistance of the government in some respect. Is that fair to say? Oh, I mean, I, I, I guess you are all talking about partnerships and yeah. uh, synergy. I am so guessing that what the industry is saying is we can't do this right without government assistance to some level here or something. I think I would say that uh, we absolutely need and welcome government involvement around the critical infrastructure. And as they do that, that we want to make sure experts are in the room because these are very complicated, interconnected issues. That is simply it. Um, Mr. Rigger, let's talk about the, uh, the, as we talk about the threat, where, where do you see the biggest threats outside of the domestic uh, United States, outside the United States? What, what, what are the biggest threats? Where do you see them coming from? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, focusing on, on the, the total consequence and vulnerability aspect, the threat actors range in sophistication and capability from nation state sponsored through criminal activity down to a hacktivist and um, entirely into a, what we call the script kitty environment. How many, how many nations do we ex how, how many nations are attacking, attacking this country on the cybersecurity front? Uh, I mean, nation actors. The, the challenge with that, Mr. Chairman, is a point that was made earlier by some of the members uh, of attribution. It is very, it's very difficult to positively attribute known activity. Even if I were to say an IP address or the, de the source address originated in a particular uh, country or a particular area, that may not be the actual uh, actor. So the attribution piece is very difficult. I, I recognize it is difficult, but you got some number in the, in the, in the, that, that you have assessed. I, at least I hope you do. What is that number? How many countries? Uh, sir, I would actually defer that to the intelligence community representatives in, a, in another forum, and I wouldn't be able to comment on that here today. 
What is the, what is the consequence for somebody who is attacking us in a, on a cybersecurity front? Is there anything we can do or have done? Is there any instance where we have actually said, okay, country X, you have been doing this, this is the consequence? What, is there any instance of us, is there any consequence of that? To my knowledge, sir, I am not familiar with any official demarche that has ever been issued or ever uh, been delivered to a particular nation state associated with malicious cyber but activity. How, how often are we getting attacked from nation states? Daily? Hourly? The well, there are hour, hourly cyber attacks, whether they originate and are state sponsored or if they just originate from IP addresses that are being spoofed as, as far as the location, if they are criminal activity or if they are independent activists that are operating. Um, under the, the protection of a nation state. Well, let's pretend we have a nation state that says, yes, what, what, what is the consequence? What, what do we do? So not necessarily dealing in hypothetical, sir, but uh, looking at the consequence analysis that the mm -hmm. Department conducts associated with cyber physical systems. Mm -hmm. One of the demonstrations that we conducted in 2007 was known as the Aurora Experiment where we demonstrated the capability of taking digital protective circuits and physically destroying large pieces of rotating equipment. This type of equipment has years to repair or replace. All right. So, now, that is cool. Yes. I like hearing that. All right. What else can we do? So, subsequently, what we recognize is that we have to uh, apply a defense in depth strategy. I hope we are doing that, by yes, the way. Yes, sir. In okay. many of these cases, these legacy-based systems are 10, 20, or 30 years old. So subsequently, we can't bolt on a new application, so we either need to enclave these pieces of equipment in a secure environment or mitigate the risk associated with operating those systems in a connected world. The, que or the comment was made earlier about separating networks and never finding a clear uh, or a secure network. In our experience, conducting hundreds of vulnerability assessments in the private sector, in no case have we ever found the operations network, the SCADA system or energy management system separated from the enterprise network. On average, we see 11 direct connections between those networks. And in some extreme cases, we have identified up to 250 connections between the actual producing network and the enterprise environment. So that is one of the challenges that we have, as I mentioned earlier, in actually securing these networks and understanding the consequences associated with the vulnerabilities and not just the threat actors. All right, that doesn't give us much confidence, but I, but it's reality. I, I that's what we're what we're after here. Um, what, what if I went down the row here? What what do you all see as the single most significant weakness in the system right now? Maybe we'll start with you, Mr. Bond, and we'll kind of loop around and end with you, Mr. Berger. Sure. Um, I would prob I would probably identify uh, better information sharing uh, coming between the government and the private sector. Um, I don't think we are sometimes free to discuss the threats we see so we can respond quickly. Mr. Lewis? I would go back to your point about consequences. If nobody's ever punished for doing something bad or even chastised, uh, they're just going to do more of it. So I think our failure to have any consequence for any sort of cyber action is really damaging. Mr. Chair? Uh, I, would, uh, I would have a tendency to agree with, with Mr. Bond that information sharing is a key component. But I would also add, uh, and I would rank just as highly, is that we need to start moving away from the mindset that we currently uh, find ourselves in, which is detection and remediation. This is, this is a cycle we are in. We detect and we remediate, detect and remediate. We are always behind the curve. Uh, we need to get a little more predictive and a little more proactive in terms of uh, reaching out, which sort of dovetails into Mr. Lewis's comment about uh, uh, consequences for action, sir. Okay. Mr. McCurr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to go last because I would say all of the above. Uh, and that was I agree with you. To do so. I agree. But, uh, with you. In addition, the, if I may add on the information sharing piece, um, or arguably we have been sharing information for years now uh, between the government and the private sector. What we need to focus is collaboratively developing knowledge so that we can provide actionable intelligence to mitigate the risk. A great example of that was in November um, of last year, there was a particularly malicious piece of code um, that was known as the Here You Have virus. That was actually identified through the intelligence community as being a known um, malicious piece of software. And within hours, the Department was able to identify that particular piece of code and provide actionable intelligence to the community through a series of declassification measures using the private sector's expertise to provide information to the private sector so they could take the necessary steps to mitigate the risk. That is the step that we need to do to actually have an effect 
on cyber risk at net speed and not just simply put together another information sharing body. I want to go quickly here about uh, the cloud. There is a lot of movement within the industry for people to uh, encourage to store their information on the cloud, uh, which creates uh, questions about security and, you know, do I trust uh, some major provider more than I trust my own uh, local server, or do I, do I question more than, or is, do I uh, uh, think it's more safe than my local, you know, my individual computer or whatnot? What are the vulnerabilities there? Should we feel more secure, more safe with cloud computing and, and movement to the cloud, or less? Mr. Mr. Let's start with Mr. Lewis this time. You caught me off guard, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Right now, I would say there is probably a, a slight advantage to having your uh, stuff in the cloud because uh, some of the companies, some of the service providers can devote more attention, and particularly for small and medium enterprises, uh, they may actually benefit from having uh, a big company, you know, a Google or a Microsoft or whoever, an IBM, uh, manage their data. There is other drawbacks to it. Um, for large enterprises, I am not sure that they uh, benefit, and a lot depends on how well the cloud service providers actually do. So on the whole, small companies better off, big companies may be a wash. Mr. Turner? Uh, I think it, uh, I, I agree with Mr. Lewis uh, in a sense. I do think, however, that the enterprises do benefit because uh, a lot of what we are seeing in the move to the cloud is driven by total cost of ownership and reduction of costs, et cetera, et cetera, from a security perspective. It is going to be contextual uh, because you are going to have to ask yourself those very important questions about who do I trust my data with. Um, and that is going to come down to reputation. Uh, and that is going to come down to uh, past behavior. And it is not meant to be a pitch, sir, but uh, that is certainly the case in the questions that have to be asked. Because if they don't, there will be a lot of people as we move to the cloud that will be able to make these services available, whether they be onshore in the United States or offshore and all these other places. And what is the track record going to be? We have to make a very uh, a very clear and very careful assessment of the information that we are willing to share, because not all information should be protected. It is not all worth protecting. Very good. Uh, let, me, let me shift here a, a little bit, if I could, um, in, in one of the last things I, I, I want to bring up, and that is, uh, Mr. McGurk, let us talk about databases. You know, the Federal Government has over 2,000 databases. Now, on one hand, you can say maybe that diversified portfolio provides a degree of safety and security, so the Bureau of Indian Affairs is separate than the Department of Justice, and I, I can understand the need that the, the, the security component of the Department of Justice is probably a little bit higher than the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But, but how, what are the weak links that are associated with that? Do we, do we want to consolidate those and have five really good uh, data warehouses or databases, or is this diversified portfolio advisable? Because I worry that so many agencies are trying to create so many different things, we are duplicating efforts, and consequently, they are all probably not nearly as secure as we want them to be. But what is what's what's your perception of that? Thank you, sir, for that question. It is actually, I, I would believe, a capabilities versus requirements um, discussion. When you talk about the dispersed nature of the databases and the infrastructure, it goes back uh, indeed to the cloud uh, discussion we were just having, uh, one of the benefits of that secure environment is that you can have a disparate um, approach to data storage so that not all the keys to the kingdom are in one location. And that provides an obscurity model for data in motion and data at rest. So by being able to do that, we can better allow for a distributed approach for data security. That being said, one of the initiatives that the Department has been um, um, executing for quite some time now is the Trusted Internet Connection uh, Program, and that was part of the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, to actually, instead of trying to um, instrument or monitor each of these separate departments and agencies, but we roll that up to an aggregation point so that we can understand flow and control the information access points at an aggregated standpoint and still allow for the diversity of the independ independent departments and agencies. Okay. Okay. Could I yeah, just sure. interject real quickly, because I want to make sure to offer to brief the committee and its members. Uh, we, our Tech America Foundation actually has 73 companies and academics involved in a commission right now to advise the government on the cloud and the leadership opportunity for the U.S. in the cloud. And one of the questions that they are going to be addressing is the security uh, profile of the cloud. Okay. And I think there are leading thinkers who would, who would challenge Jim's assertion and maybe we even say the cloud will be more secure for all enterprises. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. 
So, Mr. Bond, you, you uh, in your testimony emphasized the public-private relationship, and, and particularly with respect to education information sharing on that. So do you think that education information sharing are sufficient to protect uh, the critical infrastructure from cyber attacks? Do you think that is where we should leave it? Uh, no, I think we, we presume that there are going to be special rules, uh, regulations and requirements around the critical infrastructure. And we think education, uh, jointly identifying where the government should invest R&D dollars in cybersecurity, all will be a part of that ultimate solution. But we certainly uh, advocate for uh, clear distinction of what the critical infrastructure is, a good definition of it, and special requirements for it. Well, you know, in that vein, I, and I guess I ask this to all of you, there was the President and CEO of the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation, a fellow named Jerry Colley that you are probably all familiar with. He testified in front of the Armed Service Committee on this topic, and he said that he didn't think that there was clarity of responsibility on that. Uh, he thinks collaboration and consultation has been good, but it has been based on an ad hoc relationship with no clear lines of responsibility and authority. Are you all pretty much in agreement with that or, or disagreement? You know, in some ways, the electrical grid is the most attractive target we have for some of our opponents, and it's not secure. And so, if the statement that he made was that we have been relying on an ad hoc uh, process, I think that's right, and there's a lot of room for improvement. So, so can you tell me why there isn't a clear line of responsibility? What's the impediment to sort of deciding who's going to be in charge of this this overall overriding plan that we have? I think part of the issue, too, is the, is the responsibility in sharing the data itself. Uh, what data can you share? Uh, there are a whole host of you know, uh, impediments and barriers to sharing what is arguably confidential information in some areas. So uh, that is part of the issue that I think sort of gets in the way of trying to formalize relationships and trying to put them in a hierarchical order and say who's, this is who is doing that and this is who is doing what. Uh, I think that that is primarily what has been holding back even the larger information sharing relationship that goes on between the public and private sector, not just limited to that particular sector itself. And can I assume that, that some countries share this uh, problem and some countries don't, depending I, on the nature I, of the I, government I, in, in a given country? I am not so sure it actually comes down to on a country by country level, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I think that it is the nature of the issue itself that you are talking about the sharing of that information. And often, um, and, and this is meant to, you know, to, this is merely to illustrate a problem within the information sharing uh, network is that sometimes when information goes from the uh, private sector to the public sector, it is a one-way street. Uh, and I think that, you know, as part of the whole education thing is that we have to come to the agreement on how do we share that information and to ensure that what comes, uh, what's, that there is valuable information that can be worked on coming back the other way as well. Okay. Just on that note, um, I talked with uh, one of the larger European countries, they have set up their own, something like our Cyber Command. And they were telling me what they had done with their electrical grid and in requiring their, their grid operators to be more secure. And I said, wow, that is amazing. How did you guys get away with that? We could never do that. And they said, oh, well, when they privatized, they made sure to keep two board seats. So where you are seeing a difference emerge is that in the countries that still have a small number of service providers where the government has a more directive role. Uh, they are pooling ahead a little bit. Right now, I would say we are all sort of in equally bad shape, and one of the trends to watch is whether that changes in a way that disadvantages us. So, so let me just leave this with one last question. I will ask each of you on that. Is what do each of you as individuals think the government role ought to be in protecting uh, the infrastructure for private companies? Mr. McGurk, can we? So I believe uh, our current role that we are executing is a, as a coordinator and an integrator to provide understanding and awareness across the 18 critical infrastructures is a key role and a service that we provide. Uh, as many of uh, my distinguished uh, panel members have said, um, information may come from one sector and it may be germane to another sector, but there is no direct connection to share that information. By aggregating that um, at the department, we are able to take alerts, warnings, or indications coming from the electric sector, anonymize that information or identify the, the vulnerability, and then provide that to the water sector or the chemical sector or the petroleum sectors. So that is really a service that we provide, and it is a capability that we provide because we do have broad exposure into each of those 18 critical infrastructures. Thank you. Mr. Bond. Um, certainly 
I would underscore the notion that there needs to be a, a key role in defining the critical infrastructure and having special requirements for that. Uh, the, the farther out you move on the network and the closer to uh, consumer uh, applications and so forth, then I think we need, again, this roundtable of real experts to understand what it means in, in a networked world, because they are all connected and, and uh, difficult to, to determine regulatory schemes. Mr. Lewis. Three things, uh, some kind of flexible standard-based approach that I would think DHS and the other regulatory agencies would oversee for critical infrastructure, better information sharing, as you have heard, uh, and then finally, steps that would make the international environment more secure, steps that would deter criminals and other potential attackers. Thank you. Mr. Turner. I would agree with everything that's that's been said on the panel, and again, the nice to be going last, last is, is that it's, said, yeah. it's easier to do that. I think I would add, though, um, you know, just in addition to facilitating information sharing and making it easier, um, is you know keeping an eye towards that liability. Um, we have to keep in mind that a lot of the most of the attacks that we see today, the information is in, the attacks themselves are international in nature. So we're not just dealing with threat actors or threat intelligence that comes from. Uh, the five eyes or from you know the United States alone. We are also dealing with issues that come from other jurisdictions, uh, other Western jurisdictions, where the sharing of that information is considered, um, uh, it, well, to put it bluntly, is, is very difficult to do and can put you in a lot of hot water. Uh, those are issues that have to be addressed if we are going to get down to this role where we talk about well, how do we make it easier for governments to protect the private sector, especially when we are talking about critical infrastructure. Well, those are some of the hurdles that we have to address. We don't address them at the higher level. Sharing the information formally at the lower level uh, is difficult. It happens informally now. I wouldn't want to leave the panel uh, with the impression that uh, we do not share information, because that is certainly not the case. Uh, I personally have worked with uh, all levels of of the United States government uh, on sharing information about current threats to critical infrastructure, but it is in an unofficial capacity because there doesn't exist an official capacity uh, that we can do that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank all the panel members for their participation today, your expertise. If there are additional comments or information you would like to share with us, I would appreciate it. Mr. McGurk, um, if you would commit to this, this committee to help us uh, conduct that uh, confidential uh, that, uh, briefing. Um, a classified briefing, I should say. Uh, we would certainly appreciate that. Is that something that you could commit to? Yes, Mr. Chairman. It would be my pleasure to help facilitate that. Uh, that would be great. We thank you again for your expertise. And uh, as a fast-moving uh, fast moving industry, it uh, is changing at every moment. We appreciate your participation. And, and uh, thank you again for your expertise and your comments. The committee now stands adjourned.